Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App. FS Investments Chief Economist Lara Rame writing this. Markets are on edge as the upside surprises for inflation keep coming. Under the hood, the mix of inflation remains a problem. Services prices are just too high. Does the Fed need to cut rates? No, there's an exclamation mark, and she's going to scream that for us in a moment. There is no urgency for a rate cut. My forecast is for surgical rate cuts starting possibly Q3 or Q4. No, Laura Rank joins <laughs> us right now for more. Laura, you can do that in a moment. I want to start with Priya Misra of JP Morgan Asset Management, who asked the question, maybe a bump in the road is the new transitory. Does that resonate with you? I think that's well phrased because it's starting to feel a little bit like deja vu. Month by month, we're pointing at just one factor or one or two small one-off sub-indices that are giving an upside surprise and giving us a 0.3% monthly gain instead of 0.2. Well, if you get 12 months of those, it adds up to 3, 3.2% inflation, not 2% inflation. And that whack-a-mole sense is come back in just like it did. It's not a massive reacceleration story, but it certainly is not pushing inflation back into that convenient 2% lane that we occupied for so long before the pandemic. Laura, let's dig a little bit deeper into that as well. The consensus, I think, on Wall Street at the moment is that you can surprise, or rather you can embrace the supply side story, that growth is non-inflationary at the moment. I think Chairman Powell shares that too. Laura, what's the biggest challenge to that view right now? I think the challenge is it's not just CPI. We're starting to see, in, it's been a month and a half now of inflation upside surprises from producer prices, from commodity prices moving higher. The ISM manufacturing uh, price sub-index hit the highest in two and a half years. So it's not just consumer prices. It's really sort of seeping and bubbling up from a lot of different places. And listen, services prices are stickier. I think that's the issue. And again, it's not just rent. So, you know, you're seeing a, a nuanced story around inflation. I think unlike the growth side of the economy, everyone, you know, there's more consensus around the fact that we're in good shape on the inflation. There's still a wide range of consensus. And what is surprising is Powell uh, sort of, er, you know, interest in dismissing the latest data. Again, there's no urgency to cut rates. So the fact that he still seems so intent on that path, I think, is ca causing a bunch of us to wonder what the, the conviction behind the rate cut is at this juncture. Maybe this is the reason why, Laura, you said also not higher for longer, but a renormalization of interest rates to the 1990s and 2000s. The 10-year retests 5% at some time this year. What do you think is the trigger for that, given that everything we've seen so far, we're still a quite a bit away from that? We're still a ways from it, Lisa, but I think that we're on that trajectory. It's the higher inflation numbers. It's this very strong growth numbers. It's the productivity numbers that look fairly solid. And then I think of, there's this supply side issue in treasuries that's just not going to go away no matter what you change with the mix of funding. At the end of the day, if we're not going to have a recession, the yield curve should normalize, and it's still deeply inverted. I see that as more of a twist, some surgical rate cuts later in the year, but long-term rates drifting up. And if we have a healthy economy with 3% inflation, there's no reason why long-term interest rates shouldn't align with nominal GDP. That puts you in the 5% range at least. I don't think we should be as worried about that as we were with the rapid rise in rates that we saw in 2022 and 23. I'm old enough to remember the last time we got 5% 10-year yields and people were talking about something breaking and bank failures and commercial real estate falling out of bed. Are we basically taking that off the table now and saying this is an economy that can handle that with no problem? I am, because I think that 
this time last year when we touched 5%, it was the speed at which inflation, at which interest rates moved up so fast. I make the comparison. If somebody from warm weather moves to New York in the middle of winter, there's going to be a very unpleasant shock, and you're going to kind of freeze up. But the second winter, the third winter, you kind of get used to it, and you're out and about doing everything that you would be doing normally. I think that's the right comparison here. The longer that we're at these interest rates, the more that we'll price in this into the cost of refinancing, the cost of buying a home, and the cost of M&A activity. I think you know all of that will normalize. It was just the shock of the speed of the move. We're moving there gradually now. I don't think it's going to be as much of a problem for markets to digest. If the economy is fine and well and good, and these surgical rate cuts, you have about two or three priced in, are you actually prepared to pair them back to potentially one or none? I am. And I've been sort of, you know, on the fence about saying that I don't think two or three rate cuts are needed. I just think it's what the Fed seems to have conviction they will deliver. I think that look at markets today, financial conditions, credit conditions. I don't think that we need these rate cuts. At the end of the day, uh, you're looking at a world with higher interest rates offering a rich suite of alternative investments away from traditional equities. I think markets have digested these higher interest rates just fine. Lara, can I just say that it's winter eight or nine? And no, <laughs> I have not adapted. Lara Rain, thank you. Morgan's Jack Manley saying this, things are still looking pretty good for the equity market. The US economy is doing so well that investors should be exuberant. Maybe things are a little too rich now, but I think it's entirely possible that the market sees right the way through that. Jack, I'm pleased to say, is with us around the table. Jack, good morning to you. Good morning, John. Why can this carry on? And why can it broaden out? Well, we're talking about, like you said, Lisa, right, the economy doing well for all the right reasons, the rate environment changing for all the right reasons. That employment report was pretty significant, John, that you had mentioned. Very strong gains, very low unemployment rate, but not the pop in wages that we would have feared. I think this week, to answer that question that you guys were talking about earlier, inflation is probably the most important thing to be paying attention to. At least that's how the market's going to interpret it. I don't think any individual inflation report sways the Fed's narrative, but inflation will kind of further this story that the economy is doing pretty well because if the pop in inflation comes from a pop in energy prices, what we're sort of looking at right now, that is by definition outside of the control of central banks. The Fed can't do a whole lot about it and so hopefully they see right through it. That's how I'm thinking about it. So this. this is not because you don't want to talk about JP Morgan results on Friday at Trudy is <laughs> inflation. We'll talk about inflation. CPI, do you buy into this non-inflation regrowth story that so many people are embracing, not just last Friday but over the last few months? I, I do buy into it frankly. I mean I think a lot of what's going on with inflation today can be linked very closely to the level of interest rates. You, you slice and dice inflation, whether you're looking at the headline number, you're looking at the core number, you're removing the goods equation. So much of it has to do with the rate environment. It's shelter on the headline side of things. It's automobile insurance on the sort of core services side of things. Both of these things are going to be direct reflections of the interest rate environment. I think we're in this really kind of funny, peculiar, chicken in the egg type situation where you're not going to see meaningful downward pressure on inflation until you see meaningful downward pr pressure on shelter costs. And you're not going to see meaningful downward pressure on shelter costs until the Fed lowers interest rates, mortgage come, mortgages come down to a more reasonable level, and supply comes back online because people are willing to step into that market. So I see through a little bit of that stuff. I don't think the inflation is something to be worried about right now. Just to underscore what you just said, do you think the rates where they are are inherently inflationary? I, th I think so. I mean, it's it's so funny because if you think about where inflation was two years ago, right, we're talking about 2022, we're looking at scarcity issues. We're looking at shortages of energy, shortages of food, shortages of finished goods, all of these things related to Russia, Ukraine, China still embracing zero COVID. We crushed inflation from 9-1 to 3-0 in a 12-month span, and it had literally nothing to do with interest rates, purely to do with supply chain issues getting better. Now the stuff that's here right now, that's the stickier stuff. That's the more complicated stuff. That's the stuff that's tied directly to interest rates. So I think the path from nine to three, easy. The path from three to two 
That's a lot more complicated, and hey, we've seen plenty of evidence over the last six, seven, eight months in those prints. So does this leave you buying bonds and buying stocks because you think that ultimately the Fed's going to cut rates and that's going to be positive for yields since it's inherently disinflationary yeah. to cut rates because higher rates are inflationary? Weird environment, right? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> when, when, when I, yeah it's, it's like a tongue twister yeah. right there. Um, you know, when I think about fixed income, I have to acknowledge there is a lot of short-term uncertainty about the direction of interest rates right now. We just don't really know uh, how the data are going to continue to play out. Uh, the Fed elected to not course correct at its most recent meeting. They held on to that 75 basis point cut narrative this year, but they may change their tune a few months from now. I'm not sure. In bonds, I like the upside, downside sort of risk reward profile there, where even if I am a little bit too early and even if yields do back up a little bit more, as long as I'm not way out on the curve, I don't really have a whole lot to be worried about. So from a fixed income perspective, it is very much a three to five year kind of sweet spot from a duration side of things. And I like the higher quality assets. I like the sovereigns. I like the higher quality corporates. I'm not really worried too much about high yield. On the stock market side of things, valuations are clearly stretched right now. I think uh, even if you don't believe in reversion to mean, 21 times forward earnings at an index level is probably a little bit too high. Uh, but we are looking at this sort of broadening out of the recovery as the earnings story gets better for the have-nots of 2023. And I think that makes me constructive on equities too. What does broadening out mean to you? Some people think it's sort of within the S&P 500, away from the dominant seven stocks of last year. Others say it's look abroad. Other people it might be going from large to small. Small. What does it mean to you? I'll tell you of those three, John, it's the first one. Um, you know, when, when it comes to the broadening out of the recovery, uh, it's sort of overly simplistic perhaps, but I think it is important that investors remember that there are another 493 plus names in the S&P 500 that no one's really talking a whole lot about that have only just now started to, to, to pick up from a price perspective that are trading at reasonable valuations that are punching above their weight class from an earnings contribution perspective. And as the interest rate environment gets better this year, as inflation continues to sort of normalize this year, all of these things are going to be tailwinds for those, those laggards of, of 2023. Not a big fan of stepping down in the market cap space. I think particularly when you're looking at small cap names, the debt situation there is not particularly good. The profitability situation there is absolutely abysmal. And then from an international perspective, I like the ex-US story as long as you are really careful about what you're buying out there. You know, if I buy the European index, I'm buying European banks. I'm not particularly interested in that. If I buy the EM index, a third of that's going to be state-owned enterprises. I'm not particularly interested in that either. So if you're going there, you got to be very specific. We have a huge upswing in commodities. How do you want to potentially expose yourself to that? The huge upswing in commodities could result in short-term outperformance from those commodity-producing emerging markets, but that is not why I own EM. I don't own EM for the commodity play. I own EM for the manufacturing play, for the growth of the middle class, the demographics, all of that leading into consumption, into production of physical goods and, and even services. The commodity story is not what's exciting for me about EM long-term. So if I'm looking for commodity exposure, I want to clip that coupon um, and maybe get a little bit of price action in there as well. I like the higher quality stuff. I even like U.S. energy producers. I think it's a shorter term play there too because there's not a whole lot of CapEx. We're eventually going to have to drill more if we want to pump more of this stuff and I'm not quite sure if that's in the cards right now. But for where things are at the moment, energy companies are making money hand over fist and they are returning a lot of it back to you, the shareholder. So it's a, it's a pretty good environment. Before I let you go, Jack, you said something that was pretty radical. Mm. This idea that high interest rates are actually inflationary for the economy. How many people agree with you? <laughs> I get a lot of questioned looks when I, uh, when, when I say that when I'm, when I'm speaking to clients. But I think if you, if you break it down, it starts to make a little bit more sense. I mean, in particular on the shelter side of things, you know, the Fed has raised interest rates notionally to crush inflation. That's the whole point of this thing, right? But by raising interest rates, they have made borrowing costs across the curve higher, which in turn has made mortgage rates go up considerably, which has forced any sort of would-be home buyer who can no longer afford to purchase a home into the rental market. And rental inflation has actually stayed quite robust. And rent is what feeds through into CPI. It's not home prices. It's rent, and then it's owner's equivalent rent. And so I think if you kind of tease out the connection there a little bit, it starts to make more sense. But first blush, I get a lot of, I get a lot of huh, you sure about that kind of views? We heard that from Solfus as well, from over at Oppenheimer. Yeah, he was talking times. about the idea that that is really the key to bringing home prices lower is potentially lowering mortgage rates. He was telling us about his 10% mortgage, wasn't he? Yeah, $200,000. dollars really bad Too for bad him. with a terrorist. Oh, yeah, in Manhattan. Oh, poor guy. Oh, in Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seriously. Jack, good to see you. Great Thank to you, see sir. You. Jack Manley of JP Morgan.
Ellen, I'm pleased to say, is with us. This line that came from Ed Morse, Ellen, $90 would be the perfect number if it would be stable for a long period. Ellen, you're making an interesting point. How difficult it is it for that number to be stable for a long period? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to be stable for long periods because once that number seems like it's here to stay as opposed to just a spike due to, say, a geopolitical occurrence or uh, an environmental occurrence, you've got, uh, you, you start to get really, really uptight and antsy consumer nations. India is going to be upset. China is going to be upset, not to even mention the Biden administration, which is going to be very upset if we see this going on all through the summer. That could damage the their election chances so much because for some reason uh, American voters really associate gasoline prices with the political party that's in power currently. Uh, there's really no, there isn't really a reason for this, but it's really a, a really prevailing element uh, amongst the American electorate. And so if the $90 stays, uh, it, it really could become a problem. And OPEC is going to have a very, very hard time resisting uh, resisting the pressure both to put more barrels on the market, especially Saudi Arabia, that's already got these extra voluntary cuts uh, beyond what they're required to do under their quotas. So we're going to have to, at some point, it sounds like you're saying, see supply either come from the Saudis or potentially an SPR release. At what price level do you think the kingdom steps in? I think that they they don't step in necessarily at a price level, but uh, they respond to, to pressure. I think if they see prices going much above ninety dollars a barrel, then uh, I'd see them them step in. Uh, I think that they are also looking at their uh, demand. They're going to want to see what kind of orders they're getting for uh, from Asia, especially because they don't want to see that drop off. And it if it looks like their oil is getting too expensive for their Asian customers, I think we could we. We would see them potentially uh, start to put together uh, a price increase uh, at the next OPEC meeting. Okay, so let's talk about the potential. I'm sorry, production increase. Let, let's talk about the potential use then, potential use of the SPR. We are well below the highs during the Obama administration, but we're still at, I think, 360 million barrels that this SPR holds. The Biden administration could have a meaningful tap of the SPR before the election, no? Well, I think that's a really difficult thing to do um, because, first of all, they've already tapped into the SPR earlier, and there was a lot of pushback, especially because a lot of that oil got exported to China or to other countries, and it wasn't necessarily used domestically. And the purpose of the SPR is not to just lower gasoline prices because they happen to be too high or they happen to be too high uh, than what they prefer for an election. Uh, the purpose is really to have this in store in case there is a geopolitical political event that is preventing oil from, from getting to the United States or to other countries. Or there's a hurricane, for example, that could take out uh, production in the Gulf of Mexico. We saw SPR releases after there was a significant uh, a time where production in the Gulf of Mexico was out due to a hurricane. And if the Biden administration starts releasing the SPR just because gasoline prices are a little too high, then they're setting both a difficult precedent because then when are they going to refill this? They They've really got to refill it constantly if they're going to be using it. Plus, uh, the summer months and are coming. Hurricane season is coming. And hurricane season is strongest in September and October, which is going to be right before the election. They may want to save the SPR, basically, in case they need it uh, for, for that time. Ellen, when you are a net energy exporter, what is the appropriate level of the SPR? What do you think it should be? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, I think that that question is kind of not so relevant because we're technically members of the IEA, and the IEA has a certain, uh, in order to be a member, you have to maintain a certain amount in your SPR because uh, a certain amount of your consumption. So I think it's, it's, it's a tough call. You really should maintain, I think, more than you would think because you don't want to screw up all your exports by suddenly deciding, oh, hey, uh, we got to halt exports because we need this domestically. You, you don't want to have to do that. And so it's a good idea to maintain uh, a good amount in your SPR uh, to be used in the event of some kind of uh, embargo, stoppage, uh, you know, natural disaster, uh, and, and not to just use it because gasoline prices are 50 cents per gallon higher than you think they should be.
It reminds me of the conversation about the Fed, Ellen. We talk about what the Fed should do. We need to talk about what it will do. <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the day, you and I could talk about this. We probably agree on the same things with regards to the, to the SBI and how it should be used. It's how it is being used that I think is more important here. Do you anticipate they will be draining that SBI going into the election? I think that that really depends on where oil prices go. I think if OPEC decides to increase production at the June meeting, there's a lot less uh, likelihood that they'll drain the SPR. Um, they're not going to refill it until it's below, I think, $75 uh, dollars a barrel. But if, if OPEC does increase production, I don't think we're going to see that. They'll also probably try to push American oil producers to increase production, which is something that I don't think they're going to be very receptive to, given how much uh, pressure they've had basically on, on every other respect and how much vilification they've had at the hands of the Biden administration, they're going to do what they think is best for their business at this point, regardless of what the administration says. There are two points in there. Saudi Arabia's response to oil prices, especially heading into the election, and U.S. producers. Let's start with Saudi Arabia, since you wrote the book on the Saudi family. How willing are they going to be to help President Biden heading into this election? That's a good question. I think that they're not going to be that willing and they're going to want a lot in response. That doesn't mean that they are totally unwilling, uh, especially if they think it's a good idea for the market. So if they're getting pressure from the Biden administration and they're getting pressure from Iraq and Kuwait and other producers that want to increase output, plus they say, look, $90 a barrel, well, if it stays at, if it goes above that, that looks like it could be heading to 100 which uh, I do think seems unlikely but is absolutely a possibility then they're definitely going to want to increase production to stave that off because once you hit higher than that, you see demand destruction, and that's definitely something they don't want to get. They want to keep their Asian customers happy. They can also keep the Biden administration happy and get new defense treaties, new uh, you know military uh, equipment sold to them. Uh, if they can get concessions on, on other things that they want, then I think it would be a win-win for Saudi Arabia, especially if they can portray it as as a kind of big uh, PR coup for them. When it comes to the domestic picture, how much more can the U.S. produce? How quickly can they act as a swing producer after already pumping 13 million barrels a day? So that's a really good question. I definitely think production could be higher. The question is, is that something that they think is a good idea? Now, the U.S. isn't really a swing, swing producer because its oil production is not centralized. We've got all sorts of different uh, companies doing what they think is best. And what they've been saying is best for them for a while is not to drill that many more wells. Yes, each well, they're getting a lot more productivity out of those wells, but they are not interested in spending a lot of money drilling new wells, especially if interest rates stay high uh, and, and inflation uh, continues. They're not going to want to spend more money. They may try to get something out of the Biden administration, like uh, approvals for new uh, drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. It's possible that they could use that leverage, especially if they think that um, Biden is going to be reelected. Interesting. Ellen, thank you. We've got to leave it there. Ellen Wald there of the Atlantic Council and the author of Saudi Inc. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.